Boys and girls, ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of State Evening Gale. It's your favorite Uncle Silk. It's Dan. Dan Delatore. Same corner, same time. We back with a interview. Uh, three on one, not one on one. Three on one interview with Patrick Young. I, I you know, I don't think, uh, I don't think either of us are stopping uh, Pat from scoring. If, if if Pat wanted to get to the basket, it's going to happen. Uh, maybe if there's no no fouls, but. We're, we're really happy to be joined by Patrick Young uh, from the Providence School, from the University of Florida. Um, one of the Gator greats, someone who I enjoyed watching play um, and, and, and really uh, an inspirational young man. Patrick, we, uh, we really appreciate you coming down here and, uh, and, and chopping it up with us. No, it's an honor. It's an honor to, to still be relevant, I guess you would say. Uh, it, it's crazy. I was just talking to... Um, my former high school before they, they had an opportunity to go to go to uh, the state championship, the final four. And I was like, 13 years ago, I was in your same shoes, you know, preparing for the state. And I'm like, goodness gracious, where is time going? 13 years ago, finished up, won a state championship. And then that upcoming fall, I enrolled into the University of Florida and the rest was history from there. Crazy. That's crazy, man. Uh, obviously an illustrious career at UF, and we're going to talk to you a little bit more uh, about that. And, and Pat, I know we probably talked about this a few years ago, but uh, let, let's let's rewind. Um, talk to us a little bit about obviously being 6'10", uh, you know, yeah. your your future is kind of uh, mapped out from you uh, for you uh, early on in your life. But when did you when did you start playing basketball and when did you start getting the love of basketball? And then ultimately, uh, when did you decide that this could be uh, an opportunity for you to go to college and, and make a career yeah. out of it? So as you can imagine, wasn't always this tall. <laughs> <laughs> you went 6'10 in the kindergarten? Boy, just, no. <laughs> But you know what's what's ironic is growing up, this this is cool. The first sports organized sports team I ever played for because I played t-ball, t-ball and baseball is my first sport. The team was called the Gators, and I actually have a little have a little pin of if I can no, I can't reach it. I have a little pin of uh, that very first time me taking a picture in a in a sports uniform with the Gator logo right on. Looked the exact same minus the facial hair, of course, but. Um, baseball was actually my first sport. That was my love. Um, my, if there would have been football or there was football around, there would have been soccer. My dad was just, he wanted us to be active and fall in love with something. And, um, he played football. My dad played football at Bethune, Cookman. Then he went on and he played in the USFL with the Jacksonville Bulls for a bit. And I think he had an opportunity to go to training camp with the Packers I think he he just decided not to injuries and starting a family. He just chose that he wanted to. I think he still had that kind of what if, you know, what if I would have made that step? He was a long snapper and a tight end, but he was my dad was fully invested. And I'm so grateful and my mom in in our sports and, and getting opportunities to to love it, to find passion that um, he wanted us to have every opportunity to make it as far as we could. And baseball, man, honestly, like I basketball was in the back burner for me growing up. I wasn't very good. I was uncoordinated. Um, I, I don't know, man. It just it just didn't click for me. I didn't get it. Um, you know, I didn't I obviously I didn't want to use my left hand ever as a basket as a young kid growing up. And and baseball, man, I, like when I when I got on the, the mound to pitch for the first time, it was like something in me clicked. Um, I, I, I can remember the first time that I, I think I was seven or eight years old that I got a chance to pitch um, for the first time. And just the I don't remember how well I did. I, I think I did well that first time. But just the excitement my mom and dad had for me when seeing that first time I pitched and I did really well. And, man, I just ran with baseball for a long time. Uh, played through middle school, played, played basketball and baseball. Obviously started growing. I was six foot two in eighth grade. Still kind of uncoordinated on that basketball side. Uh, I could start to jump, starting to get more athletic. From eighth to ninth grade, I had like a five inch growth spurt that summer, where I came into to high school in ninth grade as a, about six seven. Played junior varsity. You could see I had the intangibles and the length and, and potential, but man, I could still barely chew gum and walk at the same time. And something crazy, man, just that I don't know uh, what happened, if it was puberty, if it was um, 
the work. I can't I can't remember that summer uh, from ninth to tenth grade, but my body just went through an immense change where I gained like 10, 15 pounds of muscle. Coordination was there, and then all of a sudden, man, I'm on the map. Like I was on the map for when it came to co- to, to colleges from getting recruited by everybody. And and baseball was cool, still playing at the time, but we saw that you know I wasn't enjoying it as I wasn't getting as much love as you can imagine on the baseball field as I was on the court. Um, and uh, ironically, you know I was at it before I went to you know we give Providence the love. That's where I went to first, but I went or second I won a state championship, but I went to Pax in a school for advanced studies my first three years. And my junior year, like I, had, I committed to the University of Florida after that um, after my sophomore year, uh, you know, Billy Donovan came to the school multiple times. You know, it was a uh, easy decision, easy decision. That's where I wanted to go. I mean, I grew up a Gator. My grandparents, season ticket holders, like it's and, and him being him finding the success he had at UF. It was no brainer for me to say, hey, I got the opportunity to play in this coach and hopefully go to the NBA. But as I said, I was at a college prep school and I was still a dual, a dual sport athlete. In my junior year, man, I was feeling myself a little bit too much. Started slacking on the grades a little bit. <laughs> came home with like three or four C's. And my mom's like, hey, man, you're not average, but something is contributing to you being average. So you got to let go of baseball. And man, I was heartbroken because I did want to continue to play both, knowing that knowing that I was going to play basketball in the future. Mm-hmm. And how about this? The year I don't play baseball. Oh no! They win state championship. They no. didn't win. Oh, they didn't no. win it, but they went to it. They went to the state uh, championship, man. And they were average. They, they were had like, you. They would have won it, bro. Yeah, yeah they years. just needed. They needed another pitcher, Pat. That's man, it. you want to talk about tight? <laughs> ah. <laughs> What's that feeling like when you start like noticing as a as a young man, um, you, you, in your teenage years, and you start noticing that difference when you go from being uncoordinated and and having like really gotten used to that, having grown into that big body of yours, uh, when you start figuring it out, um, what's that like mentally for you at that age? Well, I think um, you know you gotta have not having I didn't have like a, a great reference point of understanding what that looked like when an athlete is growing into his own body. You know, of course, I, I, I was a Spurs fan growing up, so I love watching Tim Duncan and, and David Robinson and Tony Parker as that dynasty was growing. So I, I, I liked watching basketball, but, you know, personal experience, I just – I didn't get that connection yet of the work that I put in is going to correlate into my performance. Hmm. And – like I couldn't, I remember not uh, my my uh, ninth grade year. Like I could dunk, but I couldn't dunk with two hands. And I'm six foot seven. Like every time I'm trying to go up there and dunk with two hands, it's just the ball's rattling out, and I'm just like getting frustrated. But all of a sudden, there was just a moment where it all just clicked, where the coordination, the athleticism, the confidence started coming. I wish I could have had more confidence and understanding. Like, hey, the more work you put in, the more confident you're going to be. But it starts. It's I think the prerequisite for confidence is humility. You know, you gotta you gotta be humble and say, all right, I gotta put this work in. I need to get coached, and I gotta like once I do those things, I'm gonna have confidence because I'm, I'm prepared. I'm coming into. I'm approaching this game with respect, and uh, it took me a while to figure that out. But man, it, it once once I I realized that, um, you know, being at my size and stature that. Uh, I was intimidating force to other teams, man. It, it felt great. It felt great knowing that, like, I could dunk on anybody. And, I mean, it was exciting. It was – It was. I just found so much joy and passion in that part of the game. And I missed that. I missed that, that purity of it. Because, you know, then it wasn't about making money or where you're going. It was just like, man, the pure love of the game in high school, just trying to go out there and ball. Patrick, let me uh... – have you wrap your head around the idea of being 
kind of uncoordinated, going through a gr- big growth spurt, adding, you know, obviously a, a bunch of muscle to a few. Can we just later. stop right there? Like, do any of us believe that he was uncoordinated at any point? Like, he keeps I'm saying telling you, I see it though, man. Like, I I'm like not to cut you, you off, but uh, I think he's telling lies. I wish I was lying. <laughs> yeah, it happens. I, I I grew up with those big kids that were like a little goofy and running around like giraffes. Uh, I see kids like that at my son track practice, and I was talking to another parent. I say it was a 14 year old kid. He's gonna be a monster. I say when he realized like what he has, you know, he realized how talented he really is. It's gonna click for him one day, and that kid's gonna yep. be be really good. So it happens when you're young, man. You just don't really know because your your brain, you got this big body, but your brain is still brain. a child. Yeah. But let me say, let me tell you this, Phil. Like if you would have asked a lot of the coaches I had growing up, you know, middle school, AAU travel. They probably wouldn't have seen it. I don't know if they would have seen that the potential I had to become where I was because I wasn't, I wasn't locked in. I wasn't. I didn't mm. take the game that serious. Uh, it wasn't clicking for me in that sense. And you know, let that be a, a lesson for parents out there that you know you don't have to force things to happen. You can't force things to happen. Right. And that's that can create resentment and bitterness towards the game, and and and, and can end up doing more harm than good. Because my parents, they they my, my dad encouraged me. He encouraged me to enforce me. Uh, and when when I made that commitment that I, hey, I, this is what I want to be really good at, he held me accountable. Mm. He pushed me, push because I asked for it. And I wish I would have did a better job of letting my dad be a better coach to me. I mean, he was a great coach, but I wasn't a great uh, sponge because he had way more wisdom than I had. I don't know why why that happens. And why we bump heads with our parents when they're trying to help us, man. I don't, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't understand. But, man, if if he would have forced and, and tried to make me – because I had a lot of friends and kids that I grew up with that were better than me, they fizzled out and never wanted to play the game or didn't do anything past high school. So let that be a lesson right there in, in and of itself. Yeah, I tell my son all the time, it's a marathon, man. We ain't trying to be park and recreation all-stars. It's it's a development process, and you got to take your time with it. Um, Pat, I want to go back. Um, so you 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 start to dedicate your 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 um, sports you know life to, to to basketball, and then you know in a really short time you go from being you know uncoordinated and everything else to getting an offer from, you know, Billy Donovan, one of the best college coaches of all time to being a McDonald's all American, all in such a short period of time. That's obviously an incredible rapid growth for you, not just physically, but mentally talk us a little bit through kind of how you dealt with kind of the emotional stress and the emotional pressure that puts on you and, oh, and being able to balance that with, with everything else you have in your life as a, a growing, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old. So so really, it was after my after my sophomore year, like my sophomore year, my first year playing varsity and the, one of the best years that we had at, at the high school I was at. I mean, we won. We ended up winning our, our uh, regular season like um, we had a bunch of upperclassmen and I was a piece. I was a piece of that team and then went on to AAU basketball and doing the um, the um, what do you call those those individual camps where you kind of can get invited to. It was like a Reebok, Reebok, Reebok headliner camp. And then if if they um, voted for you to, to go to the next step, step it was going to be in Philly at the Reebok ABCD camp. So, man, I balled out. And here in Jacksonville, it was the location. Uh, I was just like, man, I'm going to dunk everything. That's the goal, just rebound and dunk everything. So that's what I did at Reebok, the tryout camp, uh, the headliner. And then I was up in, uh, Re- in Philly for the ABCD camp. And this is like no offer. Maybe, maybe UNF, Coach Driscoll, and um, – uh, what was my name? Cliff Warren at JU. They might have been the only coaches in my circle kind of right there. And, you know, because it's local, you don't really get that grasp of like, all right, like they, they're recruiting you. Like they're not just your friends. So I go to I go to Reebok ABCD camp and, you know, they match you with a bunch of different teams. And there's uh, these these bleachers where there's every college is represented, every single university uh, D1 is represented by a head coach or an assistant coach. And I'm just like, man, I'm about to show it. I'm about to put my name on the map. So I went out there. I balled out. I And, it, you know, it's, it's kind of tough because it's a situation where everybody's trying to get their name out there. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to control what I can control. I'm going to get on this glass. 
I'm a rebound. I'm a block shots. I'm a run the floor. I'm a, I'm stronger than anybody. So I go through the camp. Goes well. I didn't know what to expect from after that. Man, I come home from this camp. I had like I I probably received maybe in my life before, up to that point a few letters from I don't know. I nothing really university wide. Man, when I tell you the mailbox was overflowing with letters from Clemson, Miami, South Carolina, uh, UConn. I'm just like, what is going on? Like, this is crazy. All of a sudden, these co- these coaches are calling my AAU coach, trying to get in contact with me to form a relationship. And I'm like, man, I don't even know how to talk on the phone. <laughs> Literally, like, I don't I don't talk to girls on the phone yet. Like, <laughs> y'all want to talk to me? So it it was overwhelming, man, and and like my parents weren't prepared for that uh, to kind of say, "Hey, this is how we're going to handle this. This is how we're going to uh, protect you from getting overwhelmed." Because it's like, yeah, I'm still a student. I still have other obligations. I still I'm still a kid. I still want to play video games. I still and uh, you know it was the person that just I just fell in love with through the process of that was Shaka Smart. He was uh, an assistant at uh, at UF. He was the guy that recruited me primarily to, to come to UF on a relationship. And I just love that dude. And I'm so I'm so encouraged by the success that he's had through his career. Um, he was the only guy that just made me feel um, feel like he really would genuinely cared and what like he sent me a book. He sent me a uh, Malcolm X's book. Um, read that like he he was he was off the chain and um man that that was life changing that was life changing and I, my only regret is is you know he ended up taking the VCU job before I got a chance he got a chance to coach me man. Uh, my only regret is like I wish he would have been there at least one year when I was at UF real quick did you get did you ever explore the possibilities of HBCU since your dad played at Bethune no it was it was never like a conversation or a thought process really um in our in our arena, it was just so overwhelming. We, you know, growing up, Florida UF was just always on the horizon because my grandparents were season ticket holders to football games, and we'd always go down up there for tailgating on on, on Gale, um, on Gale Limeran before they built like the parking lot. It was like a huge, or mm-hmm. the, the it was a huge area where the RVs would go. So it was like always in my mind that that's kind of where, if it if it happened, I, w- I was going to be a Gator through. Not through football, but if it, it would have been baseball or basketball, like it, it was going to happen. What um, what does that do to a young man? Because I mean, you you obviously you you started uncoordinated, and then you find it, and now you're starting to get a little bit of confidence, and then all of a sudden you've got men who who make a million dollars a year telling right. you, "Hey, Patrick, we need you." So, what do you mean you yeah. need me? What? How do you balance? just staying humble and, and, and being, you know, uh, humility through this recruitment process yeah. and kind of just stay true to yourself. No, it was, it was strange because I had never been someone that liked being in the spotlight. I never liked being the center of attention and getting this kind of recognition in this aspect. And, and people just telling me like, we want you here. We, we need you. We can see you fit. Um, like I remember, I remember going to to Georgia uh, on an official visit, and just like um, I can't remember the na- the coach's name, um, light light skinned black dude uh, that was the coach there at Georgia, and him just telling like we're watching practice, and he's just like, oh man, you're better than that guy. You, oh man, you will dominate him, and I'm just like, this is so strange, just that that mindset, because <laughs> I never that that level of confidence just hadn't been instilled in me yet. Mm-hmm. Um, to think that I could just go out there and get, get to college basketball and do it like that. I was just like, man, I'm just long for the ride, but it, <laughs> it, it was overwhelming. I didn't know how to articulate the emotional and mental roller coaster of all that stuff going. I was just grabbing hold and just taking it one day at a time. And just, you know, I really wanted to get my recruiting process over as soon as possible. Cause it was just, it was just so much. And that's, that's probably why I ended up committing to Florida so early um, in my, in my, high school days because I was just like, man, I'm, I'm ready for this process to be over. Pat, I want to talk about recruiting. We talked to a lot of football players on here and, and 
you know, we we've heard their stories, but on the basketball, you know, side of things, what what are some egregious things that you heard uh, on the recruiting trail? What are some things that people told you, or or promises that they made you, or or ways to try to you know get to your heart during the recruiting process? He's asking uh, about AAU bags, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you know, my coach, my coach was uh in my family. They were really good at trying to keep keep a, a lot of that stuff away. Um, we just didn't want. Um, they just didn't want me corrupted by mm. money and corrupted by they, they wanted to, to protect my innocence and the purity of like the, my decision being wholly upon the best fit and the love for the school and the relationships and those things. But, you know, I did hear, you know, coach. Yeah. I don't know if, if, if they would deny it. They probably would deny this, uh, <laughs> but uh, coach, what I was told from my AAU coach is that coach self and coach Cal kind of were throwing a, a line out there to see how, com how committed I was to Florida to see if, if that was something that they could kind of get me to decommit and come out of, of my mm. commitment. What um, comma, what comma okay. level is Patrick? Get him out of here. At? Is, is it one comma? Do you need two <laughs> commas? How committed is he to Florida? I don't know anything about numbers. I just know it was, it was, it was All right. like, just how, pretend, how, how pretend it was NIL. Yeah, pretend it was NIL world. It was NIL. Uh, oh, man. What was your evaluation on, on three? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Man. I don't know. Oh, we're getting him I'm in just, trouble. I'm just, I'm just like, man, I stayed all four years. I would have made I would have made a few dollars, like yeah. one, or, one or two. It, it would have it been nice to, to stay in and get a few deals here and there. You know they got they got kids up in Kentucky getting keys to the Porsche as soon as they they go Man. on campus. Mm -hmm. I don't need a Porsche. Give me a truck. <laughs> uh, Pat, what was the transition like uh, to to college for you? Oh man, it was hard. It was tough. Yeah. It was tough. Uh, initially, you you just don't know what you don't know, and if you don't come into this transition with humility, I think that's one of the biggest downfalls with social media, with um, kids getting so much external recognition and validation that internally they don't have this remembrance of like, this is why I do what I do. And this is who I believe I am. And this is how I can get there. I don't need anybody else to tell me on the outside. Like I came to this school to play for this coach to get coached by him and to put myself in the best position to succeed. And when the external noise of people telling you who you are and, and uh, what you can be, and that gets to your head, it gets in the way of you being coached and maximizing the opportunity that, that's set before you. Um, and also it's like going to college is a huge transition in general. You know, yeah. you're no longer under that wing of your parents of like you have to be here at a certain time. And um, I mean, they, there are, you know, obligations you have with your classes and, and weights and all that, those things. But your parents aren't there to drive you and wake you up and get you to where you like you have to start doing those things. You have to start managing your time. And I, I partially blame and I hope he hears this somehow. I partially blame my academic advisor. You don't give freshman a 7 30 a.m class mm. their first semester setting you up for failure like yep. bro what what are you doing <laughs> like just left midtown at five bro. <laughs> like, bro i just left like we trying to go to we're trying to go to canteen one-on-one cantina and we yeah, yeah. at 2 a.m and then that, that alarm goes off at six you're like uh i'm just gonna skip this one <laughs> well, well, you don't have like mom or dad in the next room yelling at you to wake you up. You're like, man, no. it's quiet in here. I can definitely roll back over. And then we're, you're out like all the we're all together, all the freshmen. We all yeah. like empty went out flies. together. So there's no one person that's like was the, <laughs> yeah. was was the responsible one of like, all right, I'm gonna be the one that gets us all out of bed in the morning, guys. <laughs> right. No, ain't nobody yeah. thinking about that. <laughs> but um, you know that freshman year, that transition. It, it was it was really humbling because I you, you I relied so much on my talent and ability of just being athletic and bigger and stronger and and faster that when you get I got to college it's like I, Vernon Macklin was the vet 
Yeah. Like, he's been in college for four, four years at, at that point. And, you know, I may be just as much physically gifted as he is, but he's more skilled. He, he knows the game better. Um, he has moves that I don't know about. And he just humbled the heck out of me. Um, and then I just had these unrealistic expectations of how the year was going to go. And when I faced an unmet reality, I just got so frustrated and it was hard for me to to mentally get over that those hurdles. Um, and it, it really got to this point where Coach Donovan was like, hey, man, I love you and we want you here. But if you're not going to allow us to coach you, allow us to to help you get better, you might be better off going somewhere else. And that's something a lot of people don't know. Um, but that was a pivotal change, a pivotal moment in my career where. I had to be held accountable for my actions and say, and look in the mirror and reflect and say, all right, what do I want my future to look like? I don't want it to look like a kid that ran away from when things getting hard, blame anybody else. I want it to look like a kid that looked in the mirror and saw that he needs, he's got a lot of room to grow, a lot of room to grow and just face those things and, and, and humbly come in and say, all right, coach, Whatever you need me to do, I'm going to do it. And and I wasn't perfect, but I did have progress in that area every year. What what were some of the uh, just? It sounds like a lot of mindset things that you had to uh, switch over. Um, what were some of those things that you had to work on that Billy Billy wasn't satisfied with? You know, it, it was I didn't. I would get you know, say for instance, we're in practice and we're doing drills, and I get fouled real bad or something. Wouldn't call it. Just hard for me to mentally let go of of that of that thing and then and, and it would just linger on to the next play and then the next play and then all of a sudden the body language is 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 bad and, and I can't get over to doing my job for pick and roll or what, whatever those things it would it would just be something small that would happen that would affect my mindset of moving on and staying locked into the bigger picture of the entirety of practice of understanding, Hey, we're here to get better. We have a limited number of hours that we can use each year. Let's not waste them. And that wasn't the mindset. It was like, I got fouled. I want everybody to know that y'all <laughs> messed up and I'm going to be upset until I feel better about it. And it's just like, it's bull crap, man. It's so immature. It's so immature. Because everybody gets fouled. Everybody gets like, this is life. What are you going to do? You're going to be bitter and, and angry and just carry on in this way when things just don't go your way. And it was a high level of immaturity. And I'm just so grateful that, um, you know, the, we don't give these coaches enough credit because they all deal with this. They all deal with this every year, bringing in new players, 17, 18 year old kids that some some haven't been really coached before. And some don't know how to handle adversity. And I was one of those. So um, they do a great job when you have the right man in place to help them learn how to how to transition into the next thing. And, and, and not only in the game, but in life. Because all his life, man. All his life, man. It truly yeah. is in so many ways. Um, I, I had a question. What what um as you transition that way and you, and you start to grow, what, what is it then like when you're the junior and when you're the senior and are you someone that became that coach or became that person? Like you mentioned, Hey, Vernon Maxwell uh, put me in my place when I was a freshman, I came in McDonald's all American thought that, that I was this, when you were a senior, was there anyone on the team that, that you were maybe doing that for? Man, I was trying to work with uh, Chris Walker, Chris Walker yeah. and Demontre Harris. Demontre, he transferred from South Carolina. Mm. Good player, man. He um he got sick, man. He he got some type of uh, he had a a minor infection, and he didn't end up finishing all of his antibiotics, and then it turned into something pretty serious. So he he got really sick, and he never you know I always look back and like man if Trey if Trey could have been healthy with us and in shape, and him 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 and me playing coming off the bench or him coming off the bench at the five because I never ended up having a five man to, like a true five man like mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. to back me up it was just primarily me playing the five um and then Chris Walker just I wanted to be intentional about trying to help him 
avoid a lot of the same mistakes, him to remember plays, him to um, understand what it means to work hard, like truly working on the small things of his game so he can get more minutes because he wanted to play, but all he wanted to do was dunk. And it's like <laughs> he couldn't remember plays and he couldn't. And I'm like, Chris, you're not going to play because you can't remember the plays. And all you want to do is like, like you can't do the small things because you're not locked into them. And you don't understand that if, if you, if you're not doing the basic things that coach is asking, he can't trust you to be on the court, your liability. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I mean, that, that that's something that freshmen got to understand. You, you, I look back at Trey Mann, and he's a prime example. His freshman year, he struggled real bad. I mean, he was thin. He couldn't get through screens. Um, he couldn't. He couldn't remember uh, the plays. He was taking bad shots. And then all of a sudden, I think I think that first year of, of getting taking a huge slice of humble pie, he said, "All right, what do I need to do?" so I can play, so I can get on the court more, so I can, like, he went to Coach White, and then he learned those things. He bought in. He changed his body. And then that that growth, that jump that he made, I mean, we saw it. He had to go to the NBA. That man that man had to leave. He was unbelievable. And, but that was only because he wanted to get coached, and he was able to buy into the little things. When you, you can do those consistent things, small, that are the foundation – then you can start gaining trust to, to do more things into your game. But if you can't do those small things, it's hard for coaches. It's hard for coaches to want to play you and keep you on the court. They want to play you. They just can't because they want, they need to win. It's mm-hmm. like they're fighting for their jobs at the end of the day. Yeah. You, that's something that you have to, you probably don't realize when you get to college, you've always been doing this and then you start getting coached really hard in practice. And then one day it'll click like, Oh, he has a really nice job that pays him well. And if, and if a knucklehead like me, if he has too many of us on the team and we lose a bunch of games, they'll be looking for another coach to, to give him that really nice job. For sure. Uh, Patrick. That? Oh, go ahead. So uh, what's your favorite away statement to play in? I um, mean, some good. I know we got Kentucky on, on the schedule annually and some good SEC playgrounds. What's your favorite statement to play in on the road? I'll tell you my, my least favorite place to play in was Bud Walton. I hated playing in Arkansas. Gosh, I hate it. I hate it, hate it, hate it playing there. Um, my favorite place to play. If you think that you hated playing there. Just imagine living there. <laughs> yeah. Favorite place to play on the road. Um, gosh. I like Vandy. I like playing at Vanderbilt. Even with the elevated court and all? It's weird. It was weird, but I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed playing Did there. you like Nashville or, 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 or the Vanderbilt's? Uh, weird arena. I never, I never got a chance to experience Van, uh, wow. Nashville until well after mm-hmm. college, and I'm glad because <laughs> you thought Cantino was bad. Yeah. Wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's something out there. Yeah, I'm really glad I didn't. I didn't. How do they like? <laughs> I understand why it's hard to win out there. Yeah, <laughs> like we really need to give Coach Stack like a lot of respect. <laughs> Uh, uh, Patrick, you you played with a lot of great players. You know Bradley Beal. Will you get? Uh, you know the list comes on. Doran Finney-Smith. So obviously, you're still doing great in the NBA. Uh, what were some of the personalities like? I know Irving Walker was, uh, you know, quite a personality. A lot of those guys were 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 uh, were very different, and and you know the personalities really yeah. kind of thrived and everything else. What were what were some cool stories about your your time there and some of your teammates? Uh, you know, Alex Tyus was a quiet guy. Um. <laughs> Yeah, he he was a cool. He was he was a little just different. Like he he just had had some walls up. But once you got to know At At was great, uh, great personality. Just just quiet. I man, freak athlete. Oh my goodness, he was one of the most athletic guys. Vernon Macklin was the biggest jokester I had ever met. Like he made fun of anything and everything. Yeah, I had I had a class time. with him my senior year. That was the Georgetown transfer, right? He he got on us as, as freshmen. It was five of us. He made so much fun of all of us all the time. He would call uh, Cody Larson uh, James Bottom Tooth, like the dude from <laughs> Family Guy. It's like, hey, I don't think anybody doing <laughs> Make fun, make fun of our clothes, our shoes, our haircuts. Like, it was brutal. Uh, and then Chandler Parsons. I heard so. I heard this from Duke Werner. He's the athletic. Uh, 
trainer with, with Florida now, he said in all his years, he's never had to separate a group of guys uh, other than Chandler and Nick Calathis because they were just the worst together. Like they just didn't, they didn't know when to stop. He had, he had to ban both of them from being in the training room at the same time because they were so bad. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Chandler was a clown. Irving, Irving was a, he's just a New York kid, man. It was quiet, strange, man. I, it's hard to explain what Irving was like. Brad was all business mm -hmm. when he got there. Um, Brad was all business. Uh, Scotty, Scotty was probably the, the most immature kid <laughs> through all four years that barely, he probably grew up in maturity, like 5%. <laughs> five percent growth. Um, That's one percent every year. He's getting one percent. Oh, he got one percent. All you can one ask. Uh, Coach Donovan had a great personality. He had a good sense of humor. Um, you know, Eric Murphy was actually pretty. Eric Murphy is like one of the most chill guys, but he was funny as hell as well. Uh, he just had this like slow motion thing about him just that he wanted to use the least amount of energy when <laughs> possible uh will was great casey were great man um gosh who else it's I mean, just Mike crazy Mike. going through this roster uh you just kind of forget some of these names i mean cody larson was one of them i uh, yep. just kind of a blast from the past uh in terms of names i'll never forget the story of Irvin walker uh stealing the taco from the street taco vendor there uh, downtown. Man. Uh, <laughs> Were you there, Pat? I was there when that happened, yeah. Oh, man. There, you you couldn't have thrown him Cody. a dollar or two? <laughs> when, Co when Cody and, uh, and Eric Murphy got in trouble when they were in St. Augustine. And it was so dumb, man. They weren't even, like, they weren't even trying to uh, – to do it, they were just they had a good time in St. Augustine and they're waiting for their ride to come and they're just clowning around in the parking lot, just walking by randomly pulling cars, just doing you know, late night doing stupid stuff. And then one of the doors that actually opens to a car, and it turned out to be the car of like one of the bouncers, and <laughs> they immediately just run, just sprint, get out of there, and that was. That was the mistake. If they didn't run, they would have been fine. Uh, but, you know, the rest is history there. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I, I want to get to your your life beyond uh, or after UF as well. But uh, you guys went to three straight Elite Eights. You guys go to a Final Four. What's that like playing on the, the biggest stage? Obviously, playing in the SEC and everything else, you get a lot of attention. But talk to us through some of those times. I mean, obviously, some yeah. crazy games to get there. Uh, what are some memories you have from that time? Oh, man, I think my freshman year, it was just kind of surreal because it was almost like we just breezed through getting to the Elite Eight. Like Kansas had gotten knocked out because we, we were a two seed that year and we had like nine losses, I believe. Um, we went up against Jimmer for debt. Jim, Jimmer, man, he just like, he just like, there was nothing stopping him from trying to get a shot off. And I remember Kenny Boyd and Irv is like, Man, because some dudes, they'll try to get a move, attack to the rim. You stop them. They'll pass it off, get it to somebody else. He will try you one way. Are you stopping me? I'm going again. I'm going again. I'm going again. I'm not passing the ball. Like, you're going to have to defend me for 30 seconds. And I'm I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad we, we got knocked them out. I remember, man, one of my – one of my – a pivotal moment for me was uh, Shelvin Mack hitting that three in my face uh, in that Elite Eight game. I just wasn't up high enough to defend him. And and from there, I just embraced being a better uh, defender as a five-man whenever getting switched on guards. Sophomore year, man, uh, another great opportunity. You know, we beat we beat um, Marquette. Um, North, that's the year that Missouri gets beat by Norfolk State in the in the first round. We beat Virginia. Uh, we beat Norfolk State. Then we uh, we beat Marquette. And then we have Louisville. And Louisville, man, we had them. We had them by like seven with 11 minutes to go. And Russ Smith, Russ Diculous, went to crazy. That was the first guy. And I felt pretty confident about my pick and roll defense. That was the first guy I just felt like he was a single man pick and roll or defense just like breaker. 
there was there was like nothing you could do. He was too fast to get around. He was too shifty. I mean, he was just had that that effect. And then junior year, we got we got smashed by Michigan. Nick Stauskas just decides, hey, nobody's heard of me, but this is going to be the game where everybody knows my name. Just goes crazy. Hits like five threes in the first half, and we're just like he was not emphasized on the scouting report. And then obviously we come back that last year, overall number one seed. Um, can't remember everybody we ended up playing. I know we played UCLA. Um, I know we played Dayton. Dayton was the game we ended up win- beat- winning to go to the Final Four. We felt confident through that whole thing that we were going to make it, that we were going to – actually, that we were going to win the whole thing. Um, just turned out we ran into a really hot UConn team, a team that, like, when you look at all the metrics of, like, the last 30 Division One teams to win, they're the one team that just doesn't make sense that won, <laughs> that won the championship. <laughs> Uh, that year, um, but man, greatest moment. Yeah, cutting down those nets, man, were uh, like none other. Going through the whole media process, just finally helping Coach Donovan get back to another one of those. Just, just wish, man, if we if we would have got through UConn, I think we would have beat Kentucky again. We just had their number, um, but you know, it is what it is. Can't go back. I'm just uh, hopeful that Miami, because I still have bad blood against UConn. I'm hoping Miami can can do what they need to do. Uh, on Saturday. Oh, no, 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 I can't, I can't get my mind to to be okay with Miami fans being happy. So, um, <laughs> I know, right? Just can't do it. Um, in basketball, yeah. All right, we got we got some it's prestigious. Uh, we're the only only team in the state that has natties in basketball. I want to keep it that way. Did you know Jacksonville University went to the Final Four in 1970? Artis Gilmore. Yeah. Well, it's Pat knew. knew. Jacksonville legend. Artist. Artist Gilmore, yes, sir. Do you know that, Dan's not allowed back to Jacksonville? Why well, not? What did he do? Oh, so oh. He, he talks a little greasy about uh, about this about where you're from, Pat. Talks a little Duval. greasy about the county and and the and the city of Jacksonville. I don't know if I want to hear this. No, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Pat. <laughs> I, I big big fan of the state of Florida here, but uh, when when looking at all of the different major metro areas, I have consistently ranked Jacksonville uh, as my least desired of the metropolitan areas um, from a nightlife perspective, food, restaurants. So I'm open to be uh, to have my mind changed about uh, about Jacksonville being a happening place. I will say I was in Jacksonville Beach. Uh, last year, I uh, went to a concert out at uh, at Daly's place over at the uh, stadium there, but stayed over in Jacksonville Beach. And I will say on this show, I did give credit to Jack's Beach for being a, a fun uh, place to be. But the rest of Jacksonville still has a, a little catching up to do. Uh, it's got somebody- some to do, but, you know, Shad Khan has been trying and fighting so hard to uh, to get the city to do a little bit more downtown because, yeah, downtown is not the most desirable. But, hey, it's about the people. Yeah, mm. people oh, great, great people from Jacksonville. I've met a lot of people friends. that have moved from there. <laughs> moved from? <laughs> <laughs> See, Pat, you, you can't even he, – he, he tries to say – he talks out of his neck. He tries to say one nice thing. But you know that there's there's three bad things coming behind that. Uh, our buddy our buddy Vari told me uh, that if I ever go to Jacksonville again to uh, to not show my face out east. I didn't know what that was until I looked it up yesterday, and, and I don't think I'll be showing my face – uh, and how to use, um, man, no, uh, it's all fun and games. Love, love the 904. Uh, Pat, want to talk, uh, post, uh, post time at UF, uh, you get the opportunity to play overseas. I uh, do do well, uh, out there, uh, won the Italian super cup, uh, in 2017. Um, I'm going to totally mess all of these names up, but play for, uh, Galatasaray, Olympiacos. Galatasaray. Ah, see, um, Olympiacos there in Greece, and then Felice Scandone. Um, 
talk to us about that that experience um, in, in your time. Um, yeah, uh, gosh. To first off, like I was with New Orleans um, after I didn't get drafted, yeah. doing doing summer league with them. Ended up signing a, a, a contract, a non guaranteed contract. Made it through training camp. Uh, I was with New Orleans up until December of 2014, where I got cut. You know, Monty Williams was the coach. Um, AD was a superstar. Had some great names on that on the roster, honestly. Um, if all these guys were healthy and in their prime, that New Orleans team would have been, like, legit. Um, ended up getting cut in December and ended up going to uh, – I had to make a decision. It's like, do I do the G League or do I go overseas? And 48 hours, I made the decision to go overseas. I went to Turkey. I went to Turkey and it was a huge language barrier. Um, it was completely like culture shock, as you can imagine, being in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. But turned out to be one of my greatest experiences um, in basketball. Carlos Arroyo was the main point guard. And that man, he tried, he threw me the lob like every pick and roll. It was, it was almost like I had I, like the first or the second or third game we played, I was like, yo, like, you really trying to throw me the ball every time? He's like, yes. <laughs> like, nobody can jump with you. And just that dynamic, I'm like, dang, if I would have had a point guard half as good <laughs> as a passer as this, I would have been a lottery pick because this man literally is throwing me the lob every time. And I, I can go up and get it. Uh, team wasn't that good, but it opened some doors for me because I dominated that first year. Uh, went on to play in Greece. I had the opportunity to do summer league with the Clippers, but, you know, I was like, man, I'm going to get this guaranteed money. And uh, I was balling up in, in, in Greece and Greece is a great place. You guys got to get a chance to go to Athens one day. And uh, in Athens, um, my coach, my coach was much better. He was a, a disciplinarian. He was like a dictator, but he knew defense really well. And unfortunately that's when I, I experienced my first injury. I, I tore my ACL and getting hit in the back of the knee in November. So I, I missed that whole first year. Um, and it sucked, man. I was balling. I was playing so well. We, I, I can't guarantee that we would have won the cha the European championship, but we would have, I know we would have made it to the final four. Um, then I, that, that whole next year ended up playing. And no, actually what was cool in that first year, we won the Greek championship, the Greek league championship. And uh, man, the celebration, those Greeks know how to party. Mm. They know how to celebrate. We come back to our stadium and beat um, – we beat Panathinaikos, our rivalry team, in the same city. Man, we got like 15,000 people outside of our stadium just going mm. crazy. Like, man, um, I don't I don't think if we would have won the championship in Florida, it would have it would have <laughs> matched the, the welcome there because that was insane. Um, ended up playing my, my second year in Greece. Still wasn't 100%. Um, I was tired of that coach too, man. He was, he was, he was a little bit much. But Greece, man, I love Greece. Love the fans there. Uh, went on to play in Italy. Um, I had to get had a bad surgery. Um, my that that would have been my fourth year. Missed that whole season. Came back the next season. Played uh, in a small town in Italy called Avellino. Um, played pretty solid there. That was like my last full season that I played. Um, we ended up making the playoffs. It was a good time. Um, lived in a great place in a great, like lived in a penthouse that year in, uh, in Italy. It was awesome. I don't like Italy though. Like they, they have such weird customs, like everything shuts down from two to six and then, that time. and then everything's closed on Sunday. Like you can't get anything done. Awesome. And most of our games were on Sundays. Like if we needed to eat, like, and nobody, like I didn't, I didn't want to have to cook, but you had, to, you had to cook. Also, uh, but um, yeah, I played. I went to Israel my last year before I hung it up, and all around, man, great experience. Which would have been longer, you know. Scotty Wilbekin, he's still out there balling. Um, Casey still ball. Casey Prather, mm -hmm. uh, Nicolathis is still doing it. Actually, Nicolathis and Scotty are in Turkey together, Fenerbahce on the same team, so uh, that's pretty dope. And um, will you get? He's still playing as well. So all those guys are still doing their thing. What's it like playing uh, overseas like that? And you, you're away from your family, your friends, and your fans that that that, that followed you in college basketball. Uh, it's great fanship over there, so I know that makes it a little easier. But what is it like being off the radar? 
it you know being off the radar isn't as tough um because there is a lot of love and validation you get from being there with the fans and your teammates and if you can lock into that and let go you say let go of like the nba dream but let go of like life would be better life is life would be different of course if you were in america but like life is where your two feet are right that's where it's at you know and and guys sometimes struggle embracing that but the fans the fans are awesome the game is different um a lot of a lot of things around are different, but you just got to get used to them. It's nothing crazy out of the like out of the ordinary. It's just the way that they do certain things. But you know, I, I couldn't stand man having a roommate every road game, having to eat pasta every pregame meal. Like those are some of the things I just was like, man, this is this is for the birds. But other than that, um, it's pretty solid. You know, you got to have friends and family that really love you. They need to come out to visit. They got You got to, you got to pay for them to come out and visit um, and share that experience with those people you love. And then you got to just embrace yourself into the culture. That's the, that's like some of the best stuff you, that you can do. Yeah. And you, you visited some really cool places, Italy, Turkey, uh, Israel, Greece. Um, I mean, I can imagine what kind of eye opening that experience is just from uh, just from being around, you know, different cultures. And, you know, I know when a lot of people travel, they'll go to heavily travel tourism areas and kind of go to areas where, um, you know, it's, it's easy, right. Where you can communicate in English and you, you just kind of follow the the path of, of museums and restaurants that are well known on Yelp and everything else. But, you know, I had a friend of mine that moved to Germany. He said the hardest part about it was just acclimating to being able to go to the grocery store, being able yes. to communicate with just normal everyday people that you're around that you you take yourself out of the tourism part. And I know for him, it was a really hard couple of months, just trying to get past you know, I can't go to a grocery store and it's not, you know, craft yeah. next to Velveeta next to whatever. Right. It's, it's all these brands you've never heard of. You don't know what they taste like. You don't know anything. Right. And so just those small things that you take for granted, you know, washing clothes and everything else. I can yes. imagine with that only else drying clothes. A lot of, a lot of places yeah. in Europe, they don't have dryers. Like you might have a washer, just but like you, don't have, line? you gotta, you gotta air dry everything. Use one of those drying racks. And you know, a lot of dudes, I know they don't like doing their own laundry. So Still, still done. It's easy. Mm -hmm. um, Pat, I uh, want to get into um, obviously where you're at now. You, you finish your playing career. Uh, you're, you're an on-air analyst with the SEC Network, uh, discuss, you know, discussing basketball and everything else. And, uh, you know, we heard some, some unfortunate news back in, in June of, of last year. You're involved in a serious car accident uh, there in Nebraska that um, has left you paralyzed from the, the waist down. So I want to talk a little bit more about, about that situation. Um, obviously I know you're doing a lot of rehab. I know you're, you're speaking a lot of places, but, but talk to us uh, about kind of that, that post playing uh, time with, uh, with ESPN and then, you know, ultimately leading us up to, to now. Yeah, man. So I finished up really, really my, the last professional team I played for was in 2020 and then 2021, I was kind of like, ah, you know, I'm home. Um, you know, not super healthy, not to where I want to be like I could play. I don't really think I want to play anymore. Just kind of is where my mindset was. And um, I just slowly just let it go and said, you know, I'm going to just be present and see what doors God opens or closes and, and just go with that. And can I, can I stop right there real quick? What What is that like? Are you falling out of love with the game or is it just kind of like it's getting harder physically to do this as I get older and my health is declining a little bit. What is that aspect? Cause uh, I, it wasn't a skill issue for you. Like when, when I quit playing baseball, uh, no one, no one really cared. They were like, you know what? Yeah, that makes sense. Baseball that, quit you. No, <laughs> uh, may, no, I'm still covering it. <laughs> um, but, but that for me at least was hard. I, I didn't want to watch baseball and you kind of went right from, basketball to now uh you know on sc network and, and to me it was kind oh, of like it wasn't that, it wasn't that quick of a process mm -hmm. but um you know i had been battling injuries since 2015 since i got hurt initially and you know it's just that adjustment of you know and i almost wish i would have had like some type of smaller injury before tearing my acl so just to have that mental that mental callousness of like all right this is what it takes to get back from an injury and what you need to do. And it's like, I had to, I went through a huge injury and just took forever to 
ever get to a place where I'm like, all right, I'm back. I'm me. And then it was just like one thing after the other, you know, having the bad surgery, just my knee not ever being back in a place. And it's like mentally I wanted to be be where I, where I would like to be. It's just my body physically couldn't. And I fight it for as long as I think I thought I could. And um, just dealing with that, dealing with, you know, not getting paid on time, coaching stuff, uh, being away from – it's just like, you know what, I love the game. Will never lose my love for the game, but just all this other stuff that comes with it, um, that's not for me anymore. Uh, so it was it wasn't too hard of a transition, you know. I, it was just like, all right, you know what, let's let's see what's next. And came back to Jacksonville, got immersed in the church, got immersed in my friendships and family, and um, was just waiting to see what was next. And uh, find, I got an in person audition with SEC Network. Um, started working with. Tebow's for-profit company, um, reconnected with my now wife, and just 2021 was just an awesome year. Um, just all these incredible doors opening. I had to learn a lot catching back up with SEC basketball because uh, I hadn't been paying attention for so long. But um, that was pretty. Um, that was pretty easy. We could get used to it after a while. Um, but I started. I started that year in 2021 with the SEC and. Um, Big learning curve, figuring things out. I had season tickets to the Jags that year too. Terrible decision. Urban Meyer was the coach, so Oof, uh, yeah, man. I'm a <laughs> yeah. Jags fan, dog. So I'm with you. We hot right now, though. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah they got see us now. I can't imagine you, you get up to like Charlotte and you're like, what do you mean Alabama? I thought I thought I was covering basketball. We were covering. You, they're good now in basketball, and you're like, they're what? Good. Yeah. No, they've they ever since Nato's got there. I mean, he just mm-hmm. changed changed the whole style of play and just like. They except you know except for last year whatever that was, that roller coaster of a team they they've been pretty relevant, um, but yeah I did did all those things and um, was just excited preparing for that part of life and getting married man just uh starting that new chapter with my wife and she we met in Gainesville but she's from Nebraska and and um has a daughter so we uh, I, I always and I always feel bad when because they're so close to bring her down to Florida. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go up and, and stay with with uh with her and her family up in Nebraska while we prepare for our marriage, cult- continue to cultivate our relationship and and just prepare because once we get married, we're moving to Jacksonville. Like that was we already agreed on that. The town she lives in is so far from the airport that it just would have been impossible for me to even consider living there. And it's freaking Nebraska. It's mm. corn and snow and mm-hmm. wind. Oh. Mm-hmm. Like I know Jacksonville ain't the best, but it ain't, it ain't that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it that. So I uh when I was up there, I, I started doing this like a little job on the side, just um getting uh trying just making some extra money, just doing something else, just uh because I was just a little bored up there. Cause again, it's Nebraska. <laughs> and um yeah, about two weeks in, I ended up getting into a, a car accident that changed the course of my life. What um I, I, I'm guessing it's, it's your faith, but you've you've been so inspirational to walk uh, to watch through this process. Just um, daily Bible verses, or just hey, a lot of people could have something like this happen to them, and hey, why me? Um, and, and it feels like at least from the outside, and maybe you've had days that are tougher, but it feels at least from the outside that that you look at every day as hey, I was given an opportunity to be here today. Um, just where have you found um, the mental strength or the faith to to wake up with an appreciation for being here instead of, you know, uh, why did this happen to me? Why did you do this to me? Well, there's, there's three words, can't change it. And that's something that we live with in, in different circumstances all the time. Can't change it. So what are you going to do? You know, you have a choice in, in how you show up every day and how you're going to live your life. And yeah, circumstances aren't what I want, but it hasn't, the circumstances don't dictate my theology or my ability to be a great dad, be a good husband, show up and and do certain things in in my, in my life. So um, it is not, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy, uh, but you get to a point where you're like, you know what? I'm not going to be being bitter and angry hurts nobody but myself and it trickles on to the people around me. And I don't want to be a source of negativity. I want to be a source of positivity and inspiration. And so that's just what I've committed myself to doing. And it's 
trying to be that as authentically as possible. Traumatic and like near death situations always uh, can be like just like you said, life changing moments. Um, does it does it tomorrow not being promised? Does it light a fire on you or like what's is that a motivational part of it? Just how fast how fast things can change. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, it I, There's a word or a phrase I try to just tell myself constantly to be relentlessly present. Mm. Be relentlessly present because this is the most important moment. This is the most important time today, right now. And am I maximizing that? Uh, you, it's not that you don't plan to think about the future, but everything, all your eggs should not be in the basket of the future. Like, I can't say I'm going to be, I, I will be joyful and happy when I'm up and walking. Absolutely. But I'm not going to wait to be joyful and happy when that happens. I'm going to find ways to do that now by just being present now. Like I'm home with my daughter because uh, my wife is out of town on work conference. And it's like, she doesn't look at me any different. She just wants to hang out with her dad. And that's what we do. She literally will come in the room and say, I'm going to harass you. <laughs> Coming in here to harass you. And it's like, all right. That's what they do. You know what? If that, that just means that she loves me and she wants to, uh, she likes me being around. So um, nothing's been more fulfilling than, you know, knowing that I'm actually impacting that little girl's life. And, and she doesn't see me as less than she's like, she just, I'm just dad. That's just it. And that's, uh, that's incredible. Um, wow. I mean, it's, 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 it's moving. Um, and just the, the outlook that you, that you have on the entire situation, it has been, it, Un unbelievable to watch right there's there's a lot of people that will get down there's a lot of people that will will kind of wallow uh in your ability to to not only bounce back mentally but but to look at it in a positive way and to to be able to highlight you know those those things that you may not have been able to to do and how that is going to impact you know your daughter and your wife and and those that are around you've been an inspiration for for everyone um I know that you've been posting a lot of vid videos about rehabilitation and everything else. So what, what's that process like? And, and what's, you know, what's, what's next for, for Patrick Young? Uh, you know, spinal cord injuries, we just don't, don't know how exactly they're going to heal. Um, it's just know it's going to take time and nothing changes if you don't do anything. And so I take steps. I, I my faith is I strive to exhibit my faith in my actions, not just by saying, I'm doing something there. I believe like I'm actually, you know, going to physical therapy four times a week, doing extra stuff at home that uh, is supposed to help me. And, and whatever that may be, um, working out, continuing to stay fit, keep my body primed for recovery. Um, those are all important things. Like we don't, you don't know what or how or when you just have to keep preparing, keep preparing for, you know, I was told to pre pre train as though I'm training for the Olympics that it's four years away but every day matters. And, um, you know, I started a foundation um, that, that cause I, you know, my experience through the healthcare industry, I just seen that spinal cord injuries and life changing injuries in general are really expensive. And there's just a lot of needs that people have to regain hope and regain their independence and freedom. And it's going to use it as a means using the foundation to, to raise money uh, to help people that, you know, pay for their, it can be, it can be equipment. It can be, uh, continued therapy. It can be um, get, helping them get their car modified so they can drive and they can actually go to work again. Uh, you know, small things like that. They might be small, but they can be profound and life changing. And um, also, man, you know, I'm just as as companies will have me or, or organizations will have me. I come just to bring my story and strive to inspire people that uh, invert adversity can be your greatest teacher. Um, and that and if we can view it that way. Uh, who knows who we can be on the other side? Because, of course, I wouldn't have asked for things to, to happen in this manner, but who I've become and, and the impact that I've made in this short time just by showing up, uh, not being perfect, not having all the right things to say, but just by authentically going through this uh, with a positive attitude has impacted more people in eight months than the first 30 years of my life. Let's go, man. Super inspired by your conversation, bro. Be real with you, man. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, any uh, any final questions for for Pat before we uh, before we let him on his way? Yeah, no. I have I have a couple. No. I have a couple. My um, my fiance is an occupational therapist, um, 
So she just wanted she wanted me to bring that up and say that she wanted you to say that occupational therapists are better than physical therapists. I think there's a little rivalry uh, between the two <laughs> between the two professions. Um, it depends on your needs. <laughs> but um, I have a question for you as a newly married man. I'm getting married in June. I need some advice. I need yeah. uh, I need one piece of of newlywed wedding advice. He said, "Don't um, go to Italy." So there's your honeymoon. Well, we're, we're going leave, to Italy on the honeymoon, so that's leave, already leave your leave all of your pride and ego at the door, mm. all of it. Every mm. time you walk in, just think about who who's coming into the house right now. What am I bringing? Am I bringing peace, or am I bringing some type of some junk into the house? Because pride. It, there's no place for it in 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 relationships. Pat got that wisdom, man. Mm. I'm telling you. Hey, let me tell you. I I did not realize how selfish I was and how short tempered and and impatient I was until getting married and having a kid and just how it affects everybody in the house. And I'm like, this is not who I want to be. Let me just throw that. I I'd rather be married than be right. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. For real, absolutely. I should have listened to that advice. The first <laughs> <time>. <laughs> 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 oh, man, great, Dan. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't have any more questions, but man, I know you, you know, at this point, man, I don't have to tell you this, man, but uh, your journey is not in vain, bro. You're inspiring mm-hmm. a lot of people, man. Uh, just keep putting that foot forward and showing up, man. I appreciate your story, bro. No, thank you so much. It's, it's, we're only in the middle. We're only in the middle. Can't For wait sure. to see what's next. Awesome. Well, Pat, we we absolutely appreciate anything that we can do for you uh, with the Patrick Young Foundation. I know you guys just had a uh, or it was announced that there was a golf tournament back in December. If there's anything that you're you're looking to do uh, in the future events, any way that we can help you, we'd love to do that. Uh, and we're rooting for you. Uh, and uh, like like Silk said, you're you've got an inspiring story. Um, an incredible comeback is is already happening. So oh, we're yeah. we're we're excited for you, man. And uh, anything that we can do for you, let us know and. Other than that, we'll uh, we'll see you guys next week. All right, thank you guys. Have a great awesome. one. All right, have a good Appreciate one. Pat.